ask you, okay, can I ask you about your missionary or your projects and those things going okay? I've had probably 15, not quite 15, a dozen of you whose missionary projects have blown up on you in your face. I apologize for that. It's like doing some sort of science experiment and blows up on you, so I'm sorry. And you've joined the bibliographic project. So we'll take a last call. If there's anybody else who needs your, your missionary and your project, you're trying in good faith, but it just won't work. If you need to bail on that project and start something else, see me by the end of today's class period and we can get you an alternate project. I'll set that up with you. Uh, otherwise, this far into the semester, we trust that you've got your proposal with your missionaries in and everything's going to go. Any, any failure uh, from the experiment, any failure of the project from this point out would be very unusual. That's what we're hoping. Sound good? Okay, great. All right. Scholars, let's try to get back into our lecture material. Where we pick things up for the remainder of our time this class period is with the um, Counter Reformation. We've got a little over a 60 minute hour to deal with the Counter Reformation. So this is where we're headed. At this point in the semester, we've discussed a whole bunch of reformations taking place in the 16th, 16th century. We spent a lot of time in the 16th century. We have one more class period that's dedicated to the 16th century. We've looked at the German Lutheran Reformation, with, of course, Luther and done some really biographical work on him. We've done some work with John Calvin, also in the 16th century, looking at the French Reformation. French is uh, just grazed at the, uh, we just take a very, very brief look at the Swiss Reformation. We really didn't do that justice, but we're speeding through the course. We took some time with the English Reformation, and I put a lot of you to sleep. Today, we're going to be dealing with the Roman Catholic Reformation, or the Counter-Reformation. Both terminologies, um, both terminologies work fine. It refers to the same movement. It used to be called the Counter-Reformation more prominently, and in the last, I don't know, 50 years or so, uh, Roman Catholic scholars have uh, rightfully uh, lobbied for a more positive title, where it's not just Counter-Reformation. It's not like everything that's happening in the Roman Catholic world in the 16th century is is reactionary, uh, but to look at this movement in the 16th century from the Roman Catholic perspective as also a time of growth and development, and, and to look and see what that looks like. So we will look at the Catholic Reformation or the Counter-Reformation. The term Counter-Reformation is only coined in the 19th century, and it's suitable enough as long as we understand that this is also a time of flourishing for the Roman Catholic world, and not all theological decisions are being, that are being made are being made in response to Lutheranism, although quite obviously uh, uh, a lot of the shaping of the Roman Catholic world is done now in dialogue with this new Protestant movement. If we're looking for a figure who really sets things um, sets things in a clear trajectory, we can say that Pope Paul III is the, if you will, father of the Counter-Reformation. He dies in 1549. And it's under his leadership that we get sort of the theological agenda for this Catholic Reformation. So very significant things happen under the leadership of Paul III, we have, probably most uh, significantly, we have the founding of the Society of Jesus with the Jesuit order, which takes place in 1540. Okay. This is going to be, in my humble estimation, as one who is an alumni of Southern Jesuit University, the single most important uh, step in, uh, in developing this Catholic Reformation. But there's going to be another, uh, a number of other things that are enormously important. In 1542, we have the reestablishment of the Inquisition. That's not a very happy thing to talk about, but very significant for uh, this time period. That's in 1542. 
And last but not least, in 1545, we have the Council of Trent, which I believe runs until 1530, excuse me, 1563. And you know what? Actually, as important as the founding of the Jesuit order is, I have to say, actually, the Council of Trent is going to be the single most significant thing. Nothing tops an ecumenical council. That's why they call them ecumenical councils. Yeah. It was a long council. Look at how many years that was. <clears throat> There's a lot of things that go into this, uh, this decision. If you're just looking to the Council of Trent, Counter Reformation is going to be your best terminology for this movement because the Council of Trent, if you look at the theological documents that are produced there, the decisions that are being processed, that really genuinely is a response to, the, to Lutheranism. Most of the theology developed and solidified in the Council of Trent is done with an eye towards these pesky Lutherans and, and the Roman Catholics sort of choose all of the other options that their Lutheran counterparts don't. Um, but, but this is part of a broader movement. The Society of Jesus the Inquisition. And you know, we can add to that too. It's not so much a, it's not an institution that carries with it um, continuing, continuing theological creativity, but it, it does, it's a marker, nonetheless, it's, it's, a, it's a watershed moment. We should add to this list of important things that characterize this counter reformation. We should uh, begin, we should also mention the Diet of Regensburg in 1541. <clears throat> Diet of Regensburg in 1541. Hey, all of you juniors and uh, uh, sophomores who are looking for a study abroad opportunity, why don't you go to study in Great Quiggles semester in Germany in the spring next year? Just an idea to check it out. Which is in Regensburg. You can go look at these original buildings and get all the history from some books there. You're doing pretty well. Okay, so these are the events that come together in the middle of the 16th century that set a very clear theological agenda for the Roman Catholics. At, at the Council of Regensburg, let me see, do I have a slide of that? I'm afraid I don't. Okay, sorry. Um, you know, one of the other things that we should do in this class is figure out how it is that you, from the classroom, can take control of the screens above. Palmer, do we know how to do that yet? Could somebody submit on Skype an image that you could then load up top? Yeah. Let's try it. What if you find the building where the Council of the Diet of Regensburg takes place? Could you do that? I didn't get a chance to actually put that slide together. If what if you put it up on Skype, it will magically appear on our overhead. That would be really nice. And uh, if it works well, we can keep doing that as long as you put up pictures that are. Uh, entirely to the point and, and educationally minded. We can just do that as a habit to request that things will go up on top. All right, so what is this Diet of Regensburg? It's, it's, um, it's the watershed moment where the Roman Catholics and the Lutherans realized that the reunification is not going to be possible. And as I mentioned earlier in this class, the reason that this only, or the fact that this only happens in 1541 should catch our attention. That means that. It's, it's reunification is imagined as the likely end to the scenario of the uh, of the uh, Reformation up until this point, until it's seen that it's entirely impossible. Now, what I would like to do as we're dealing with the Counter Reformation here is dip us back in history a little bit. And I've I've mentioned before, I've, I've given you the the idea before that. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church was attempting to reform itself up until the 16th century. Let me talk to you about some of those reforming efforts. One of you, I think, last class period or class period before gave a very good question. How was it that the Roman Catholic Church was attempting to reform itself? Let me speak to you about that and uh, see if I can trace that out in a little bit larger detail. Let's go back in history a little bit before the 16th century and see what the trajectory of the Roman Catholic Church is. Um, let me talk to you about the Council of Constance. If, if we're talking about Catholic Reformation, here's some attempts prior to the 16th century, which all, all of which failed from a Protestant point of view, and I think really from a Roman Catholic point of view as well. But let's look at these. First of all, the Council of Constance. 
1414 to 1418. I would like to submit to you that this council represents an attempt to reform the church. It just didn't work so well, but it's an attempt. <clears throat> the Avignon Papacy from 1309 to 1376 precedes this council and is a terribly uh, embarrassing thing for the church generally. The Avignon Papacy. You know, from 1309 to 1376, this is a terrible thing for the Roman Catholic world. The, which is the, the Christian world, but the Christian world of Christian Europe at this time. After this terrible embarrassment, uh, um, and after this, this uh, relocation of the papacy, the Avignon papacy comes to an end, and the papacy removes, relocates back to Rome, but the church is then rocked by another competing scandal, or a rival scandal that takes place immediately after this Avignon papacy. What's that? We have the great Schism, oh well, Western schism, let's get our terminology square. We sometimes refer to the great schism as the divide between Eastern Christianity and Western Christianity in 1054. Here's how this breaks down, scholars. Gregory XI is the last pope of the Avignon Papacy. He dies in 1378, shortly before, uh, um, shortly after, excuse me, relocating back to Rome. Now, Gregory XI is a Frenchman, as you might expect to be the case, given that the papacy had been for several generations now in southern France. So most of the noble class there uh, had been resourcing, um, or been the sort of drawing pool for the, uh, the Pope's cardinals, and the cardinals act like presidential cabinet or something like that. So you, your administration as the church, as the church as the papacy returns from Avignon back to Rome, your, your cabinet is stocked with Frenchmen. And Gregory XI, too, is a Frenchman. This is absolutely unacceptable to the Romans, who demand that the Romans, that, um, uh, that the next pope be a Roman citizen. Now, as the popes are, excuse me, as the cardinals are deciding who the next uh, pope will be after Gregory XI, and, and the mob outside is demanding a, a Roman pope. <clears throat> uh, pope Urban VI is elected, who's neither Roman nor French, uh, but he's from Naples. So he's Italian, as we would think of today, but he's not Roman per se. It's shortly thereafter that the Roman, the, excuse me, the French cardinals are going to elect a rival pope. They're, they're quite dissatisfied with the outcome of the election, thank you very much, and conclude that the reason why a French pope was not elected was that uh, the cardinals were under duress from this mob outside of the Sistine Chapel, demanding that they uh, uh, elect a Roman pope. So you have the, the French cardinals then electing their own pope, and now you have two popes who spring up. You've got Clement the Seventh. Um, uh, and you've got, uh, let's see, we've got another pope. I'm trying to get my bearings there. The Alexander the Fifth. Okay, so this this terrible divide that comes in, in the church is known far and wide as a a desperate uh, point on which the church absolutely must reform itself. The Council of Constance is an attempt and actually, in this case, a successful attempt to reform the church, specifically on the point of uh, taking away the competing popes and having a single uh, single recognized uh, uh, papal administration for the church. Now, it's also in this, this Council of Constance that some things happen that are really terrible from a Protestant point of view. Do you know what I'm thinking of? How else do we know the Council of Constance? So in one way, it is a reforming council. Some other things happen that are quite... Uh, uh, quite discouraging from the proto Protestant cause at this council. What are those things? John Wycliffe, what happens to him at this council? He's already dead, but what happens? He's condemned, and it's, um, it's uh, promulgated that his bones should be uh, dug up and, and burned. Now, that doesn't happen for a few more years yet. Who else is condemned at this council? Right, Matthew? Yes, Huss is condemned and burned at this council. 
So you see a church that's in turmoil. They, there is some reform uh, of the, the, the um, yeah, these gross scandals that are taking place in the church. You've got three popes at one point. The papacy is no longer in Rome, etc. There is reform from those, uh, of course, I should correct myself, of course, the Advent of Papacy had come to an end by the time that the, the Council of Constance is finished, but that's a lingering, the, the uh, Western schism is a lingering problem that's inherited from the uh, Advent of Papacy. So there is reform at this, at this uh, institutional level, but there's also this increasing distance that begins to grow up from the people's demands and from the church's administration. Now, the uh, Council of Florence also we can look at as a, an attempted reform. It's, it begins at 1438. It begins in 1438 and I think runs to 1445. This we can also see as a reforming council. The council was held in a number of different places. It's originally conducted in Basel, and then Ferrara, and then finally Florence, all in, in Italy. The council fails, but its attempt, what it's att it is attempting to do is to reunify the, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Western uh, Roman Catholic Church. The council ultimately uh, fails. Uh, during Luther's, Luther's day as well, we have the Fifth Lateran Council, which is also an attempted council. None of this works. All right, so when we get to the 16th century, century properly then, and when the church finally does have another council, that is, of course, the, uh, the Council of Trent, we have, we had the need for a reforming council for, for several uh, several decades, over a hundred years, we needed a reform council. There have been attempts at reform uh, through councils. Do you know what the conciliar movement is? Can any of you hazard definition or a, uh, give me a sketch of what the conciliar movement is? And I have not explained that in this class. That's fine. That's okay. That's what I was looking for. I was just looking for a response. The conciliar movement is an attempt to reform the church. Through, through universal councils. So, along the side, even back from the time of John Wycliffe, right, uh, scholars of all pers Christian persuasions are theorizing about how to reform the church administration, how to get rid of a little bit of bureaucracy and how to function, things function better, etc. One of the prominent theories for how to do that is this idea of a conciliar movement that. Uh, you could you could reform the church administration at the highest levels by bringing together a council uh, that would represent the entire body of Christ through all all geographies, uh, and that could be the instrument to help set a new agenda that could get the church back in a position of, of real reform. The conciliar movement has its highest watershed moment or its, its highest watermarked moment, if you will, at the Council of Constance, when it effectively um, deposes, it's, it's on the, the authority of the conciliar movement that we do depose at that time two antipopes, and it's left with the third real pope. That demonstrates the power of the conciliar movement. How could you get, if the, if the pope is otherwise the high, if the pope is the highest authority in, in the church, in the Christian communion, how is it that you can get of buying popes to step down from power, well, through the influence of the ecumenical council. This is the, the high water of the conciliar movement. The, the, the theory continues that it's through councils that the church could find real reform, but there's less and less payoff, if you will, through these other councils that come down and we can draw the uh, council of the Latin finals so from 1512 to 1517. There's less and less real reform that's affected through these councils. With the Council of Trent, the Council of Trent is only kind of a reform movement. The Council of Trent represents much more an entrenching of, uh, or a, an authoritative decision of the Western Roman Catholic Church that they're going to follow in this clear uh, trajectory against the more popular forms of Christianity that are arising in Northern and Central Europe. Uh, the Protestant Reformation. The Council of Trent is a massive affair. It's an enormous deal. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, at the second, and we're going to make one more historical reference back early to earlier to the 16th century, the second Diet of Speyer in 1529, as well as at the Diet of Augsburg in 1530, there was some talk of the need for a reforming council. There was talk of the need for a council that might bring together Lutheranism and Catholicism. Uh, there is a council, finally, but it's not going to bring uh, Lutheranism and Roman Catholic. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church together. There was trouble all along the way about when and where to have this council. It was clear that there was need for it, but where and how to have it was not clear at all. But Pope Clement VII, who dies in 1534, same year that the English Church takes on its um, its beginning form with the first act of supremacy from King Henry VIII. Pope Clement VII dies in 1534, and Pope Paul III uh, takes over in the same year in 1534 and will die later uh, in 1549. Under Pope Paul III, we finally get the beginning of this uh, ecumenical council, the Council of Trent. Pope Paul III is determined from the beginning of his papacy to convene a general council. As originally conceived, it was supposed to bring Catholics and Lutherans, Lutherans together. It doesn't work that way, but there's clear need for this council. The Pope demands, being an Italian man and having his power base in Italy, the Pope demands that the council be held in Italy. But he also wants Lutheran authorities to be present, uh, and also English authorities. Now, with the English Reformation well underway, is if we're going to have talk of reunification, we need to also talk about the English Church, what's taking place up in the 16th, uh, up in 16th century England. And let's get Francis I involved. None of this is going to work. Uh, these other kings, Francis I, Henry VII, and also the German nobles, are not going to participate in a council that takes place on Italian soil. That's not going to work. So preparations for the council stall and stall. Finally, however, on November the 11th uh, in 1544, Pope Paul III calls for an ecumenical council to, to, to address this divided, this deepening rift between the Roman Church and the Lutheran churches, and they do convene the Council of Trent. <clears throat> One of the most significant achievements of this council is the Roman Catechism. The Roman Catechism is published in 1566. Fifteen sixty-six, and this is uh, the Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. It comes out of the Council of Trent. Do you know when the last time was the uh, the Roman Catholic Church has had a catechism published? They wouldn't want to hazard a guess. Shoot, what was last? What is the most recent form of catechism that the Roman Catholic Church has? You got it, Ben. Was it in Can you believe it? It was nineteen ninety-two. Look at this! So, if you're trying to figure out what the Roman Catholic Church believes, the two most recent catechisms are 1992 and 1566. Wow. So, and I'll just throw this out as a, as a personal testimony. If you're wondering uh, what Roman Catholics believe, and uh, you want to cut through all of the stereotypes that we might care, have about each other, and you want to actually know what the Church believes, uh, you can look it up now in a cheap, accessible volume that's available, no doubt, at a Christian bookstore near you. Uh, and, and it's kind of remarkable, actually, that you were born probably only a year or two after uh, the, the, this volume, which was published, updating the Roman Catholic Church. Now, what's extraordinary about the, the Roman Catholic uh, uh, Catechism? Now, what's extraordinary about this is the enormous gap here of over 400 years between these catechisms. So it, it is true uh, that the, the Roman Catholic Church had many anti-Lutheran ideas and doctrines for many hundreds of years. You can make a, a general statement like that, and that's true. Uh, but don't trust the stereotypes or, or the, uh, um, the popular opinion to figure out what the real differences are between Protestants and Catholics today. This document has been out only for a decade or two. It's still sinking into the culture. 
uh, two decades out, many people still don't know that the Roman Catholic uh, views have changed since since the uh, Council of uh, Trent. Well, I'm speaking as a Protestant. I said the Roman Catholic Church's views have changed. That's that's a Protestant opinion. All right. Uh, let me read just a little snippet of what this Roman Catechism is about. I'm, I'm accessing an article here from the 1913 Catholic Encyclopedia, and it, this is what we read in that, that text about this catechism. We read, the catechism differs from other summaries of Christian doctrine for the instruction of the people in two points. So here are the two uh, defining features of this Tridentine catechism. One, it is primarily intended for priests having care of souls, and two, it enjoys an authority uh, equal by no other catechism. That's, of course, uh, speaking, that, that the author of that article is speaking in a pre-1992 context. The need of a popular authoritative manual arose from a lack of systematic knowledge among pre-Reformation clergy and the uh, concomitant neglect of religious instruction among the faithful. The Council Fathers that gather in Trent in the middle of the 16th century conclude that the reason why this Reformation is going, why the Protestants have broken away from the Roman Catholic Church, or however you want to view that, is because of the terrible neglect and ignorance among the priests of the 16th century. The Council Fathers conclude that if we had a better educated clergy, none of this would have been necessary. So the catechism, the Roman catechism, is devised as a system, sort of a curriculum, to teach uh, uh, Roman Catholic priests so that they can teach the people, so that there can be uh, in greater unity in the church of the 16th century. Now it's very interesting too that that agenda, that agenda of bringing education to the common people would largely be the mission of the Society of Jesus. The Society of Jesus, founded in 1540, some have described as the stormtroopers of the Counter Reformation. They were bringing this Counter Reformation theological agenda out to, to the whole world, as, as broad as they could possibly bring it. Um, it's a new monastic order that's founded in the 16th century. I'll talk to you in just a moment about the founding of this order. And the mission of these folks is to bring education to the church. That's the way they intend. The, from, from, the, from a Jesuit point of view, the problem is that the uh, Lutherans have broken away from the Roman Catholic Church and it's disunity of the church. That's the problem they're trying to solve. The way they're trying to solve it is through education. That's the Jesuit mission. The Council of Trent affirms a lot of things that we still might think of as traditionally Catholic. The Council of Trent affirms the doctrine of baptismal regeneration. The Council sets down curses that uh, uh, should one not accept these doctrinal, doctrinal definitions. And this is the onset of the confessional age, so Trent is irreconcilably different from the Lutherans and the Calvinists. There won't be serious talk again of reconciliation for several hundred years, and the confessional age that, that arises allows Lutheranism and Calvinism and other reformed expressions of Christianity and Roman Catholicism to become completely entrenched uh, against one another. There are, uh, uh, what takes place next is there's a, this continuing fragmentation of the reformed forms of Christianity, uh, but I, I don't want to be overly negative about that. One of the really amazingly positive things that takes place uh, from this fragmentation of Reformed Christianity is you get an enormous mission movement that's going to follow. Remember when we, we had uh, Dr. Manage with us just a couple of weeks ago, and we asked him about uh, the missionary enterprise of uh, Calvin and his company of pastors, and, and Manage gave us an excellent answer for that, and that is that Calvin and his contemporaries were not really mission-minded in the way that we conceive of missions today. None of the reformers were. That's something that's going to grow up after the Reformation. In many ways, it's going to be a, uh, the upswing of the Reformation. With all of the division that comes in the church, uh, and with the uh, new discoveries, the new geographical discoveries that are also made in the 15th and 16th centuries, there's a new mindset that grows up in many churches, and that is this missionary spirit. Let's cross the seas or cross international boundaries in order to bring a church 
uh, what we conceive of, of as the true church, let's win back these foreign lands, or let's win for the first time these foreign lands for Christianity. That missionary enterprise has uh, become such a staple feature of 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th century Christianity is really something new that would not have been possible without the Reformation of the 16th century. All right. Um, let's see. Scholars, do you have any questions at this point? Go ahead, please, David. What do you mean by a confessional age? All right, that's an excellent question, David. I have explained that. Well, there's something that arises, so we'll come back to this in a moment. Okay, amazing. All right. <laughs> Um, there's something that arises here called Protestant scholasticism. Now this is strange because of course 16th century Protestantism flees scholastic forms of Christian theology. Scholasticism there without, other, without an, uh, uh, any other uh, adjective modifying it, scholasticism uh, by itself is, of course, this movement in the 1200s and 1300s where Christian doctrine is solidified with these Aristotelian uh, syllogistic forms, right? Uh, and, and early Protestantism, Luther and Calvin and the generation following, are adamantly opposed to that form of doing Christian theology. In the generations that come up after first and second generation reformers, you have, in an, un in an ironic way, you have a new form of scholastic scholasticism. Protestants and Catholics both try to mess each other and prove the other wrong, as of course is entirely natural. Uh, both trying to do that appeal to highly philosophical forms of, of expression for their doctrines. So the theology that's written immediately after the 16th century and into the 17th century has a new rigidity, a new formalism, a new philosophical sophistication that develops. We call this form of theology Protestant scholasticism. So when I say that Christianity comes into this confessional age, that's what I mean. These churches are working out very detailed uh, and, and sophisticated confessions uh, in the years following the trend. Good. Any other questions? Any other questions? Scholars, I am very sorry, but I need to take just a second. Praise God for funerals. <laughs> so good to be with you. <laughs> Let's talk about the, uh, I don't know how else to do that. Let's talk about the founding of the Jesuits. Let's talk, uh, now the founder of the Jesuits, I'm going to give you a little biography here, is Ignatius of Loyola. He will have his order founded in 1540, but that's not where it begins. It begins, it's a very, it's a very personal story, really. Ignatius of Loyola, let me give you his name. A personal surprising beginning to this, this movement. And when we, we, for the next several weeks, we'll be increasingly talking about, talking about missionary activity as we meet 16th century uh, Christianity and move into what follows. Is, is now missions is going to be a staple part of this class. The Jesuits you can think of is the beginning of that broader missionary movement. Um, the Protestants will have a marvelous spin at missions, what we call sometimes the modern mission movement. That's going to take place beginning, usually, after William Carey's uh, the founding of the Baptist Missionary Society in 1792, and then there's going to be a flurry of new mission organizations founded after the 1792 date. But the Jesuits were at this for a very long time. They, uh, they were doing this about 200 years before William Carey was born. Um, and, and here, when we go to this extremely early period of, of mission movement in the modern period, we can see exactly how missions is really founded through uh, or developed through these Reformation themes, trying to bring back uh, 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 Christian unity to the church. 
The Jesuits are granted official status as a Roman Catholic order in 1540, and their numbers exploded. It was an explosively successful movement. By the time that Ignatius Loyola died in 1556, there are 1,000 Jesuits in this order. Uh, that's only 16 years, of course, after the founding of the order. In, in 1626, you do the math, in 1520, excuse me, in 1626, there are 15,000 Jesuits worldwide. Their, month, their numbers peak in 1964, which is when there are 36,000 Jesuits around the world. Uh, their numbers since have declined. In, let me just see if your historical consciousness is up and functioning today. What's taking place in 1964? I mentioned that this is a peak, the, the high water mark for, for Jesuit numbers worldwide. And after that, until the modern period, there's, there's decline. What's taking place in the world in 1964? Cold War? Yes, incidentally, good. Daniel, what else is going on? Especially in, in the Roman Catholic circle, perhaps. Got it, Brady? Right? There is. It's called what, folks? Vatican Council II, right? It takes place 1962 to 1965. That council uh, did some marvelous things for uh, inter Christian uh, dialogue and inter Christian um, discussions. Did some really bad things for the Jesuit order. The Jesuit numbers have not recovered after that. After Vatican II, incidentally, there's a huge decline in numbers of what Roman Catholics call vocations. So you have many fewer priests signing up to be priests, many fewer nuns signing up to be nuns. And why? Well, because if the Roman Catholic Church is going to start talking to these other Protestant bodies, I'm not sure that I actually want to be a nun anymore. Maybe I want to do something, right? If, if, there, if you broadly conceive of having other options, other denominational options, or if that even crosses your mind as a possibility, and it becomes increasingly difficult to muster the conviction and, and uh, um, uh, spiritual resolve to um, spend the rest of your life as a celibate monk or not in a particular, uh, but increasingly becomes conceived of as a, as a particular denomination. So uh, today, I haven't checked recently, but in, in the early 2000s, there were about 19,000 Jesuits worldwide. Uh, but that's a, a, almost a 50% decrease from their high water rate in 1964. Some of you may be aware that in recent years, uh, there's been what's, what some have been talking about as a uh, crisis of locations. That the, the number of people signing up to become Roman Catholic priests are so few that the structures won't actually maintain themselves. We won't actually be able to take care of all the churches that we have. We won't be able to celebrate Mass in all of the churches that we even have with the number of. Um, uh, young people signing up to be Roman Catholic priests. This is not the voice of God speaking to you. I'm not telling you to go sign up, but uh, many have noted that there's there's this crisis of locations taking place, and this is a, this is also where the story expands on that places that have been very successful, um, where Roman Catholicism worldwide has really flourished, and on the European continent we have Poland, it's a very strong Roman Catholic. Country, lots and lots of the priests today are coming from Poland because that's one of the, the places where Roman Catholicism is, continues to flourish, or from what some call the Southern Cone, right? From South America, Roman Catholicism is doing great in in, uh, um, in South America, and many priests worldwide are being uh, ordained there and then uh, serving as priests elsewhere around the world. But let's get back to the beginning of this story of the Jesuits. Let's go back to the beginning. And by the way, wave your Argentinian football flag. Uh, the Pope, Francis I, is not only the first non-European Pope for, I think, over 800 years. I think that's the number of people uh, But also the first Jesuit Pope. Amazing. Okay. What did the Jesuits do? They built schools in 1626. So I'm giving you the fast facts, and then we'll get back to Loyola's story. But uh, in 1626, the Jesuit order could boast around 400 colleges. And by 1749, 
The Jesuits had about 800 colleges and seminaries worldwide. And we have a number of them here in the States, uh, whole universities in our standards. Uh, Earl Gonzaga University is a Jesuit university. We've got Boston College, Georgetown University, Seattle University, and so on. Um, and there's a whole bunch of secondary schools in the United States and worldwide as well. Now, the Jesuits deeply impact the way theology is done in both Roman Catholic circles and in Protestant circles in the years that follow the Reformation. You heard the, the, uh, the adjective, it's actually a pejorative adjective, so don't use it too much, but have you heard of the adjective Jesuitical? Possibly, check it out on Google, and then one of you throw up an image to Homer's when you put it up on board, perhaps. Jesuitical. Well, it means exacting, logically exacting, or um, uh, philosophically technical, or perhaps overly technical. Uh, it's a pejorative term, so it means over the top, over the top in, in careful, logic chopping, syllogistic argumentation. It's polemical. And one is always trying to like fence it that. You're always trying to mess the other uh, and cut the other person down with your brilliant use of logic. Well, that is the way that Roman Catholics, uh, uh, following the Jesuits, develop their theology. It becomes much more formalized and philosophical. And the Protestants answer in kind and, and develop a theological systems that become every bit as Jesuitical as the Jesuits themselves can muster. So there's an enormous impact in, in Christian theology across the board that this movement develops. I think we could say that overall, in the whole history of the church, the Benedictines have probably had a larger imprint on Christianity. After all, they had a thousand year head start on these folks. So as far as monasticism and the broader history of monasticism is concerned, I think the Benedictines still hold the record for probably being the most influential form of that monasticism. But uh, given its relatively short lifespan of over 500 years, the Jesuits have done pretty well for themselves. Who is this guy, Ignatius of Loyola? Um, hey, there's a lovely statue of Ignatius of Loyola on Fordham University's campus. It was put up over the year that I was there, so I think it's about 2005 to 2006, it was given to the university. Can you just buy that for us, Palmer, and put that on the screen? That'd be lovely. They actually, from this, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about it as soon as I see the image. Ignatius is born in either 1491 or 1495 to this powerful, noble family in Spain. And Ignatius is born in this, in this world that's experiencing change every bit as rapidly and dramatically as our world today is. We think that change is new. But I'm inspired by the words of Regina Spector, who says that just because everything's changing doesn't mean it's been that way before. Yes, I won't sing it to you, but <laughs> right, change is the only constant in our world. Uh, what's taking place in, in Ignatius' world? Think of the impact that these things would have had. It's in 1492, and of course we're talking about life on the Iberian Peninsula. 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella complete the century-long project of reconquering the, the uh, Iberian Peninsula for uh, um, Spanish powers. So Muslims and Jews are expelled from Spain in 1492. This is something that uh, Western Christians in the Iberian Peninsula have been trying to do since about the 7th, uh, 8th, 8th century, 700s. So that is an enormous change. <clears throat> what happens also in 1492? Uh, well, the New World is opening up before the eyes of the world. Christopher Columbus arriving in the Bahamas and declaring in India and so on. And there's a little confusion at first on what they discovered, but that's an enormously important uh, discovery that's going to change the world. Uh, it couldn't, couldn't be a truer thing said. Uh, this is all taking place as Ignatius is growing up. Ignatius is born about the same year. We're not sure of exactly his birthday, but right around the time that these very important dates of 1492 were taking place. Of course, he's a young person when, when all of these intellectual developments through the European, Central European, and Western European universities are taking place that we now call the, the, uh, the Reformation. Loyola himself is not an academic. 
There we go. That's a wonderful statue of uh, Loyola. I wanted to tell you that I believe it was that that statue there is actually cast, the face of that is actually cast on his true dead mask. So I believe the rest of his body looks slightly cartoony than not, but uh, the face mask is meant to be the actual depiction of a man's uh, uh, image. Loyola himself is not an academic. He is a soldier. That's the way he, he conceives of his life. He's, he's a very chivalrous person. Uh, I was reading one story of the Jesuit movement who, I'm paraphrasing it in my own language, but basically said that Loyola was raised on all of this chivalristic garbage uh, and had this huge idea of, uh, of himself and courtly life and just sort of fanciful uh, uh, in this, um, uh, caught up in this world of early 16th century chivalrous ideals. Now, he experiences tragedy uh, in 1521, which is, by the way, the same year that Luther is being excommunicated or threatened with excommunication from the Roman Catholic Church. Loyola experiences tragedy. He's in battle, and he's hit by a cannonball. His brother is, excuse me, his uh, leg is smashed. A cannonball rocks through his leg and smashes it. And he's, he's a person at this point in his time who thinks quite a big quite a lot about his own physicality. He's very concerned that this, uh, he doesn't know what's going to happen to his own concept of self-identity if he's not a uh, robust, healthy young person. And he, he's losing this physical capacity to be a soldier. He's probably going to walk with a limp for the rest of his life. He comes into a, a time of total crisis. And doesn't know who he is. One of the details there that maybe we'll cite too is that uh, I think it's shortly after the battle, his leg has set wrongly. And so he has a friend re-break his leg, I'm sorry, re-break his leg and set it correctly so that at least he'll walk with a, the slightest leg possible. It would have been a terribly painful thing to do. And, uh, and this is the kind of person he is. He's a person who understands pain and battle and uh, really prizes his own physicality. He wants to keep his full uh, physical function. Nonetheless, he's going to walk with him for the rest of his life. He can't serve actively as a soldier after this. Some of you will understand what this is like. I was never athletic, so I don't. But some of you might. I had a brother-in-law, for example, who uh, uh, was a big hockey player and did some really marvelous stuff, um, but broke his ankle and then had to spend a number of months recouping and couldn't come back on the ice. That's really, really hard for some of you who, who know in the first place what it's like to be athletic. Losing that athletic capacity is pretty disorienting, or can be. And Loyola is going through all of this. What is Loyola going to do? He knows that his life as a soldier is over. He's going to experience pain in his life for the rest of his life. While he's on his bed recovering, he reads this book by someone called Rudolf of Saxony. It's called, the book is called The Life of Christ. And it's a book of spiritual meditations that changes uh, uh, Loyola's uh, mindset, changes his whole mindset. Of course, he's in a place that's right for this type of deep spiritual change with all of these other changes taking place around it. It's a, it's a book, Ludolf of Saxony's book, is a book that would ultimately influence Thomas Akempis' uh, um, book. If any of you know Thomas Akempis' book, The Imitation of Christ, that's the sort of spirituality that we're talking about that's leaking through this book, The Life of Christ. It's a book that advocates that one place themselves in the scene of the Gospels as one meditates through the Gospels. So if you, you are uh, reading uh, a passage of scripture, perhaps a particular healing incident uh, that you read about the Savior performing, uh, you would imagine yourself in that crowd with all the busyness and the feel the heat and the sun coming down on you. And you don't have enough, you're, uh, you're drying out, wondering how you're going to find your next meal or get enough uh, water. You're going through the actual experience of what it would be like to be in that crowd. And everybody becomes terribly excited. And you're trying to get ahead of the crowd, like little Zacchaeus, you're wondering what's taking place over there. And everybody's attention is sort of drawn to this area, and 
Jesus has just healed somebody. Somebody's standing up. You never met the man before in your life. You don't know who he is, but somebody over here is walking around who claims that he could never walk since birth. And, and, and everybody's attention then goes to Jesus and they're wondering who's that. This is the sort of exercise that we hope Saxon is advocating in the practice. And while they had some time on his hands, he starts doing that. He starts this form of Christian meditation. He spends a year at Congress of Monastery. This is in 1522 to 1523, and he's uh, uh, going through this time of intense spiritual contemplation. It's reported that he's uh, sometimes praying seven hours a day, and he's added to his own account, in his own record of what's taking place. He's having lots and lots of visions. He's going to see stuff. He's fasting all the time. He's having extraordinary spiritual experiences. Later, he's going to write a what becomes a spiritual classic and really be foundation of Jesuit spirituality is going to write the spiritual exercises. Which some have described as a cookbook in its writing style. It's really formulaic. Now remember that Boyle was not a literary man. So we shouldn't expect that this was going to be, uh, I don't know, something with the flourish of uh, uh, Calvin's writings or something like this. No, it's a very simply written book, very straightforward, and very systematic, very programmatic. It's a book, ultimately, it's going to come out in the final edition of this, it's going to come out as a manual for spiritual retreat. Uh, how is it that you can know the will of God? Well, here's Loyola's answer to that. If you want to know the will of God, take four weeks of your life, meditate through these exercises, and you will know what God's call in your life is. Sounds pretty fascinating. It's also what continues to be used as the foundation for Jesuit spirituality today. If you are signing out to become Jesuit, we'll push you through one of these retreats, and you will know the will of God, which invariably actually is to join the Jesuit order. Surprising how it works. But yeah, this, is, this is nonetheless a, a spiritual world classic. In the first week, what's the retreat have to do during these four weeks of meditation and contemplation? Well, in the first week, the retreatant is going to become aware of, of his own sinfulness. How are you going to know what God is calling you to unless you have a clear concept of your own sinfulness, right? Actually, it's kind of how the gospel works, folks, even in our lives today, too. Um, um, unless we are clearly aware of what God is trying to change in us, there's not going to be much spiritual energy to do anything. To, uh, other, if, there's, if there's not a direction of any sort, it's not motion of change in your life, then you're kind of in the spiritual doldrums. There's not much wind blowing in your sails. And Royal understands this. So first, get a grip on your own, your own uh, sinfulness. What is it? Where it is that you that you uh, need change? How is it that God is trying to change you? During the second week, one focuses in on the life and ministry of Christ. What is it that Christ actually did? What was his person like? On on the third week, you meditate at the crucifixion of Christ. As it were, experience this, this crucifixion scene. And lastly, you meditate on the resurrection of Christ. I had the privilege recently of talking to one of the faculty members of John Dragon University, who also happens to be a huge fan of virtual reality. And uh, he's a uh, senior faculty member there who's been reflecting on the use of technology in theological education for a long time. He was telling me about these cool ideas he had for uh, uh, like online rituals. Performance of online rituals. It's pretty interesting. Something that I basically never thought about before. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they're practicing this retreat uh, years down the road with virtual reality. Actually, folks, I don't think it's going to change their spirituality. I doubt it. It's a form of meditation. That this spiritual exercise is outlines for means of spiritual meditation. Now, I'm going to pull something up for you here. Uh, well, actually, I'll pull that for you. Uh, let me continue to give the man's life stories. Okay, so he does recoup. He does heal enough to uh, uh, to leave his hospice. He uh, leaves uh, Manresa Monastery. He's only there for a year. He goes and studies. He studies. He's a sake. 
he can't be a soldier anymore, he decides to become a student. He heads out to the University of Paris, and I have already told you that it's at the Collège Montaigneux, where John Calvin and Knox, and also Loyola, studied for a period of time. So he heads there. Now, when, Jeff, when uh, uh, Loyola goes to the University of Paris, he's probably not the most promising student. Um, he is, uh, he, he's not invested himself in academic work previously, so he's, um, he doesn't have a lot of accolades or background in academic work. Uh, he hasn't taken writing class. He doesn't know how to write an academic paper equivalent to the university system very day, so he's learning everything from scratch. Uh, he's um, 37 years old, so and he's also he has this military career behind him that, that Loyola is not proud of, it didn't work out the way that he wanted it. Um, so he's perhaps not the person who everybody immediately recognizes as the rising star of the university. But guess what? This man planned to join universities than anybody else put together. Uh, he's going to become one of the most brilliant advocates for Christian theology and world mission the world has ever seen. Look at those statues of that. Okay, at the University of Paris. Now, this is the most, this is the, 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 the earliest beginning form of the, the Jesuit order. It's a bunch of friends at the University of Paris. Loyola finds six other male students who share his passion for Christian mission. This is the way they're conceiving of it at first. Remember, this is 500 years, uh, this is the very beginning of the modern mission movement. So people don't conceive of mission work the way that we might today. What is it that they're talking about? Well, they're talking about all of this new territory that's opening up and all of these places that need the church and Xavier is conceiving broadly of could there be a military-like order that would take the church to places where civilization hasn't yet started. That's, that's the idea that sort of uh, being grown at this university with these other friends. Now, Loyola has a lot of hard work ahead of it to actually, first of all, get these other six male uh, uh, friends of his to, to see his vision. So this doesn't happen immediately. Uh, one of his earliest followers is Francis Xavier. Those of you who know the name Francis Xavier, probably the most famous Roman Catholic missionary ever. Um, I think he's going to have some 700,000 baptisms that he will have to, uh, be meant to perform during his life, many of them in the far east, which is totally off the radar of Europeans at this point. So uh, they're going to do some pretty extraordinary things. But Francis Xavier also is not the most promising missionary. If Loyola is not the most uh, easily anticipated uh, academic, Xavier is not the most obvious candidate for missionary service either. He is a, uh, can I, let's see, He's a, he's a party animal or something like that. You pick the appropriate term of your just, uh, dialect that's going to work for this. But he's, he's somebody who's uh, not taking his studies at all seriously. He's from a, a wealthy family background and he's sort of uh, surfing on mom and dad's credit card and, um, and having a whole lot of fun and buying a lot of people drinks. But he's not doing much in the way of study. Now, wouldn't you know it? By some sort of act of providence, he's roommates with Ignatius of Loyola. Imagine how these folks get along. So, and uh, Xavier is, or one would have thought, that he would have been a very promising academic. He's uh, of a traditional age, he's a young person, he's from a well endowed background, he's a very charismatic type. Everybody likes him, he's always the center of attention, everybody's looking at his shoes when he comes in the room. All right, this is this is Xavier, but he's he has this sort of Frivolous lifestyle that drives uh, that drives Loyola uh, bananas. Finally, and Loyola is preaching, as it were, to Xavier over the, the months of their time living together. Loyola is trying to get Xavier to a point of care in his Christian piety, to uh, sobriety in all ways of living. Finally, Loyola breaks through to Xavier when Xavier runs out of money, he gets himself in an embarrassing situation and has to appeal to Loyola for a bailout loan, which Loyola very generously does comply with, but also has a few moral restrictions that he's anticipating that Xavier will follow through on. And guess what? This is the beginning of what is truly a famous relationship. 
the order can, does not formally form until 1540. You can see that up to 1500 up on the board again. But this group comes together in 1534. So there's this incubation period of about six years here, 1534, when these six, seven friends actually get together, some of whom uh, are tremendously famous individuals and have already mentioned. There are a few others who are, aren't quite as well renowned. Uh, but these are all friends from the University of Paris who come together. And at this point in 1534, they all take vows, although not under an official structure, but they all take vows together uh, in this mutual pact and decide to commit their lives to what we would call today world mission. Now, and they eventually appeal to Pope Paul III, who surprisingly enough gives them official standing uh, as an order of the monastic order of the Roman Catholic Church, and they become extremely successful. But it, it's not, again, it's a very unusual uh, beginning point. This is, we, we just have so many uh, surprises at the beginning of, of this form here. Good. Now, what happens? Well, originally, so when these seven friends present themselves to uh, Pope Paul III, their first plan is go, to go off to the Middle East. Their plan is to head off back to the Levant. They're going to go to these, these places where crusading activity had taken place, and they're going to try to win back um, uh, modern-day Israel and Syria and so on for, for the church. That's their original plan. That doesn't work. Uh, they never launch out of that plan. What they do instead is head off to India and the Far East. We have Francis Xavier. So Loyola sort of becomes the office controller, as it were, or even some sort of administrator for this purge of the friend. And it doesn't actually travel much, despite, despite his former life as an, as an officer and one who seemingly would have really enjoyed that. That's not what he does. He stays back at, at the office and sort of helps everybody find their way around. Uh, and, and becomes headquarters, as it were. Xavier is the first person they dispatch. He has a remarkable mission in India, Indonesia, Japan, and he hopes to arrive in China. He never does, but his hope is to get to China. I, I mentioned he's often known as the most famous Roman Catholic missionary, period. Uh, and it's claimed that he made some 700,000 conversions during his uh, lifetime. So this is pretty remarkable, in, given that he's working in places where his language would not have been understood. He must have been working through translators. As a European, he would have been totally a fish out of water in what we call Far Eastern cultures. Uh, so given the enormous, uh, given really the enormous hurdles that he had to cross, this is really uh, an incredible ministry that Xavier has. And 700,000 conversions, how do you do that? Just running the numbers, what does that even look like? Well, it's basically a mass baptisms on an ongoing basis. That's the only way that you get to those kind of numbers, is that it seems that he was just, uh, there were these, these large gatherings of people that all decided to become Christians and get baptized. So they would just spend hours in the dark with people, uh, sprinkling, excuse me. Good. Uh, do you have any questions at this point as we begin to we begin to wrap up this first first uh, discussion of the, the rise of the Jesuit order? Do you have any questions? Now, Paul, you've been very busy today, but do we have a quiz waiting? No, there's no quiz. Okay, so we have, we have a moment or two. I can I can flesh a few things out for you, but really I'd like to take some questions and ask you if you have any questions. Go ahead, Daniel. What form of Christianity did Xavier bring to the East? Was it more Catholicism or some sort of Protestantism? It was uh, it was uh, hardcore Roman Catholicism. So it was it, it was Roman Catholicism of this type that was motivated by uh, this sentiment that the, the Lutherans were wreaking havoc, that fighting the church, we've got to win the world back for the true church before the Lutherans get to them. It was it was this sort of uh, uh, competitive, highly driven form of 16th century Roman Catholicism that's fueling this missionary activity. And which is again why I say that 
The recognitions would not have been conceivable without the recognition. Let's see. Go ahead, please. You had a question. I'm sorry. Kendra, go for it. Yeah, so, when you're talking about the recognition of the name, Good. The Jesuits, so they do have a particular style. They've, uh, they've been such a large and such an active organization that they do have. You could, you could easily study their individual history for the rest of your life if you ever uh, run out of source material. So we could, we could characterize their particular style, but, but their goal was to be, as Roman Catholics the Pope, and I mean that not in a jesting way, their goal was to adopt uh, a very centralized, very, very, uh, um, an entirely pure Roman Catholic perspective on everything. That was their goal, their state of goal. Yeah. Go ahead, Josiah. Would the response to the Savior's mission really be this Good, good, Josiah. As far as I know, Xavier's mission and the remainder of 16th century mission work with the Jesuits, if I can speak broadly, I don't think there was much relation to the Inquisition at all. Given that the Inquisition was in places where the church was already very strong, and, they, and of course these mission missionaries, there's an early missionaries in one place where there was no point of Christian presence. Good, good, Josiah. Hey. Um, Um, 
so would the idea of bringing more unity between like Catholics and Lutherans and Methodists, would that be a more of a possibility, or are we just so different now and everything is all different that it's not even worth it? So that's a very good question. You know, could a Newton Council be possible? Is that what I hear you asking, Jeremy? Right. right. There, there's nothing. There's nothing clear that's in motion. There's no obvious way. Uh, some of us are watching. So, like storm watchers, you know, some of us are watching to see if something like that particular place, myself included. There's no obvious way that something like that's going to happen immediately. There are tiny little seismic rumbles, if you want to speak in those terms. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox Communion is getting together for, they're getting their patriarchs together and having a council. I think this June, there's been some talk about whether it's actually happening, but we think it actually will happen. Uh, and that will be unique internally to these different bodies of Christianity and even of coherence that they can all get put around a single table. Now, Christianity being in its fragments for all types of Christian traditions, the question is, could all of these large blocks Easily call the Eastern Orthodox community. Is there a little here and there in that community? They could come around the table. If they did, would they mutually recognize one another? Right? Those are real questions. But there's some good subjects with the Eastern Orthodox uh, uh, probably coming together in June. That's a very positive sign. Uh, there's no, the, the, uh, the dialogues that have sprung up between Western forms of Christianity, Roman Catholics, and Protestants, Evangelicals, Lutherans, Methodists, whatever, those are mostly brother. Course. And I think many people feel that the formal type of relationships that can be established between those, those types of uh, uh, meetings have, have mostly run the course. So I think people are genuinely looking for a new form of, of uh, interaction, dialogue, what would that be? Something perhaps more organically based. Good. I have been personally surprised, as some of you know, I do some interview work and I'm talking to different scholars, usually within evangelicalism, but I, I enjoy talking to all kinds of Christians. Uh, and as I've been asking them about questions of the unity of the church, I've been surprised how much openness I've found. Um, still, the mechanism for how Christian unity would come together or how council could be formed isn't clear. So I think I see a lot of goodwill. I don't see a clear mechanism. Great. Scholars, thanks so much for your engagement today. Next week is spring break. So enjoy your spring breaks. Be safe. We'll look forward to seeing you in two weeks.